Hello. Happy Earth Day, everyone. It's April 22nd. Hey, Kim. Hey, Tracy. Hi, Amy. Thank you guys for tuning in. I'm just going to wait a couple of like one minute before we actually officially get started so people can get on to the live broadcast. I am so excited that you guys are here. Uh, <laughs> I had all these plans for Earth Day because so much of what I talk about is about reducing how much we consume and Earth Day is just the perfect day for that. But of course, the coronavirus has changed everything. So I really wanted to just find a way to connect with everyone and share some of this information that I was going to share in a workshop tonight anyway. And I was going to share this whole month in live workshops uh, all around the capital district of Albany. But this is, I think this is a great solution, right? I can connect with you virtually, share this information, uh, and just do something to honor this day. Earth Day is a really, I mean, we have this beautiful, beautiful earth. <laughs> what can we do? What small changes can we make in our lives to help the planet? Um, the awesome thing about what I'm going to talk about is that not only when you make these small changes, are you helping the planet, but you end up helping yourself, right? So you, your you help your wallet. <laughs> um, you make your home feel better. Uh, so I'll get into all of this, but I'm just kind of rambling now because I'm waiting for a couple of seconds for people to hop on here. Um, but we are going to get started really soon. So thank you guys so much for being here, Juliana and Patty, Naomi, Linda, Claire, Judy, Colleen, Gail, hello, uh, Carol, hi, Amy, happy Earth Day. So as I'm going along, um, if this is a, a full workshop that I do, uh, I usually I do it at libraries, I do it at schools, I do it at places of worship, um, I do it in companies. So this is a, this is the whole workshop. You guys are getting to see it no matter where you live around the world. As I go along, if something that I say makes sense to you or resonates or surprises you, make sure to have a reaction. Give me a heart or a thumbs up or something or a thumbs down, you know, whatever it is, uh, so that I know you're still here and you're engaged and that really helps out. Hey, Jenny, nice to see you. So for those of you who are not familiar with me, hi, Keely and Kelly. For those of you who are not familiar with me. My name is Jess Marcy. I am a professional organizer. I am based in upstate New York, right outside of Albany, but most of the work that I do with people now is online, uh, which actually has worked out really well <laughs> with the with us having to be, you know, kind of in our homes right now. So I work with large groups of people. We have a thriving Facebook community with almost 3,000 members. It's called Prioritize Your Sanity. It's free. It's encouraging. It's totally judgment free. So if you are looking for support around clutter, then definitely get in there. And without further ado, oh, let me just get to the right slideshow here. This is the answer is less. So as a professional organizer, one, first of all, <laughs> I've seen a lot of garbage, right? So I have seen a lot of, um, just going into people's homes and, oh, there I am. Okay, so I have seen in this line of work, you know, you see a lot of stuff, just a lot of stuff. And I've talked through so many issues with my clients that they're facing regarding the stuff, right? That is the nature of the work that I do. One of the big issues that many people tell me they struggle with is how to dispose of things properly or how to find the best home for something that they own, uh, where, what can be recycled, how can things be recycled. And so in the beginning, I really, you know, I didn't have great answers for these questions. So I decided to dig in and to start doing some research because I really wanted to be able to help my clients come up with good solutions for basically the trash that they have. So this is, we're really right now talking about trash, right? Like what do we do with recycling? What, you know, what can be recycled? Um, people just hang on to things because they don't know the 
best thing to do. So that's how I kind of got into this line of thinking when it, you know, with consumption and garbage and disposal and recycling, that's where this workshop kind of came out of. It's a natural progression of the work that I do with clients in their homes is to be able to educate them about consumption. So that's why I'm sharing this with you guys today. <laughs> I have found, you know, through and through with all of the research that I've done, and I'm going to share a lot of that with you in this presentation. The best thing that we can possibly do for the earth is to consume less starting immediately. So garbage and disposal of items is very nuanced and complicated and often contradictory. So the best thing that we can possibly do is just reduce the amount that we consume to begin with. The answer is less came out of a blog post that I wrote about New York State's plastic bag ban. And I'm just going to read you a little snippet from this post. Efforts to reduce single-use plastics in grocery stores often result in the use of alternative options or material types, and each one of those is fraught with their own environmental impact problems. Paper bags actually use a tremendous amount of natural resources to produce. Ironically, you guys, the plastic bags came to be because of the environmental issue with paper bags. Reusable bags may have to be used over 20,000 times to make their carbon footprint smaller than a plastic bag. After this is over, I'm going to link to this blog post because I, um, I actually have uh, my sources for everything that I say in this, in this blog post. So if you want the source material for where I got this information, I will link to that. Anyway, it's clear that if we replace one consumption habit with another, it is not necessarily better. The production, consumption, and disposal of any item are nuanced, complicated, and it's mostly invisible to us. And the science behind it is flat out confusing and often contradictory. So what is the answer? Should we be more concerned about carbon emissions or landfills? Oceans full of plastics or forests devoid of trees? It's the age old question, right? Paper or plastic? So my take on this is that the problem is that we're really trying to answer the wrong question. Paper is better than plastic sometimes and plastic is better than paper sometimes, right? It really depends. But the best choice is to avoid as much of it as possible. So the answer is always to consume less. The answer is less. That is where this whole pre the title for this whole presentation comes from this kind of thought process through plastic bag bans. So um, at the end, we can do Q&A, uh, you know, um, and I can share more of my thoughts on plastic bag bans, but always, <laughs> I think we're just answering the wrong question. It's not paper or plastic. It's how can we consume less? One, so basically in this presentation, I talk about why we consume so much. And if you've been following me for a long time and done my boot camps, you've heard a lot of this information. Um, but then we go into the impact of consumption and how we can actually start to consume less. So practical ways that you can start implementing immediately in your life to consume less. And then I always end my workshops and presentations with random thoughts. <laughs> so after that, we will also have open Q&A in the comments. So why do we consume so much? In my opinion, it is a consumption trifecta, right? It's human nature plus advertising plus ease of access. And let me just explain what I mean. In terms of human nature, it really is human nature to hoard resources. So early human societies had primitive and inefficient ways of collecting resources. Those that thrived were ones that developed high rates of consumption and new innovations for recess resource gathering. So going back right to the beginning of humans, the human societies that have been the most successful were the ones that were able to collect and preserve the most amount of resources. This is hoarding, right? So this is what we call hoarding, which was an evolutionary advantage to humans for so long. And it's only recently that it's kind of turned the corner and become really a disadvantage. So 
if we saw this pantry from 100 years ago, we would think, oh, wow, this person, this family, this group of people is doing so well. They are going to make it through the winter with no problem because they have effectively gathered and preserved their resources to make it through another season. But when we see this same picture today, it feels very different, right? So it's the same, the same act, collecting and preserving resources, but it just has a different, it's different today because we have never lived in a world that is so full of stuff. On top of that, we are dealing with advertising, right? So it's human nature to collect and preserve, to hoard items. And then we are living in this world where advertising has never been more sophisticated, right? So advertising points out, basically it's very fear-based. It points out a problem that you probably never knew you had. It makes you feel bad for having it. And then it sells you a solution. So the end result of this twisted process is a lower quality of life, more time spent working, and horrific environmental damage due to overconsumption. And the average American sees between 4,000 and 10,000 advertisements in one day. I have debated this number with many people, but my personal <laughs> testing in just, you know, 10 minute increments shows that just scrolling your Facebook feed for one minute, you see an average of 11 to 12 advertisements. Even if we go back to this pantry here, you see advertisements every time you look at any packaging. Like this is just basically tons of advertisements that you're seeing just opening up your own pantry. You see advertisements driving down the road. You see advertisements in the form of product placements. So you don't even know that you're seeing an advertisement. You're just watching your favorite sitcom and there is an advertisement, you know, because there's a thing of Lysol there, right? So that's a product placement. Uh, so really advertising has never, ever, ever been more sophisticated in terms of putting advertisements in front of our faces. And advertisers right now have the best understanding of what actually sparks a sale, what makes a consumer go from thinking about a purchase to actually making a purchase, right? So the understanding of how our brain works when it comes to buying has, of course, never, never been better. So we are dealing with tons of advertisements feeding into this human nature to hoard. And here are just some examples of advertisements, just two quick examples. You know, you might be at Target picking up one thing, right? And then you happen to go down the cosmetics aisle, you see this neck firming cream. All of a sudden, you have this fear that your neck is not firm enough and maybe you want to buy this to firm up your neck, right? So these advertisements, these, these ideas just come at us without a, us even thinking about our necks before we were in the aisle in Target. Um, Colgate, you know, toothpaste. I mean, every product that you have in your house promises something that you have a fear about. Maybe your, your fear is that your teeth are not white enough, right? If you didn't have that fear, you sure start thinking about it when you look at your tube of toothpaste. So, I mean, I, it's just, I just use these two examples to illustrate that really advertising is everywhere and kind of getting into this fear based idea. You know, you might not even know that you have a fear, but the advertiser puts that fear right into your head and then very, um, very easily sells to you because they know exactly how to do it. Okay, on top of, so this is the consumption trifecta. So we have human nature plus advertising. And then the last part that I think is really critical that we need to acknowledge in 2020 is that it has never, ever, ever been easier for things to come into our homes, ever. So right now, there is a recognized parasomatic disorder that is shopping in your sleep. So we've heard of sleep walking and sleep talking and sleep eating, but right now you can actually be diagnosed with a disorder that is shopping in your sleep because it is so easy for things to find their way into our house. It takes virtually 
no effort. Even, you know, 20 years ago, you had to actually go someplace to get something. You had to leave your house. You had to make the effort to leave your house. Now there is literally no effort. You can just in your sleep, roll over, grab your phone and make a purchase without even knowing that you're doing it. So (laughs) it is the consumption trifecta, human nature, advertising and ease of access makes it very, very difficult when it comes to consumption, right? So it's just, it's so easy to consume right now. And the impact of overconsumption is pretty dramatic. It, It impacts basically every area of our life and our world. So there's an emotional impact, a financial impact, and then there's an environmental impact. And since it's Earth Day, (laughs) we will talk a lot about the environmental impact. But just briefly, the emotional impact of overconsumption is that basically, the more that you consume, it actually does not make you happier, right? So consumption, we this is another kind of fear based advertisement idea, consuming items will make us happier is actually not true. Now we intuitively know this, but I just want to give you guys some data to share to show that it actually also scientifically works out. So the um, the graph on the left of your screen, income and happiness over time, the percentage of very happy is the kind of the, the line on the bottom, the almost straight, you know, horizontal line on the bottom. Now compare that to the real income per head, right? So income is going up, we're consuming more, but we are not any happier than we've been in past decades. Now, let me just move my head over here so I can give you guys um, this one on the right here is consumption over. uh, So amount of consumption versus savings and loans. So the blue is consumption. So you can see the consumption over time. This is from 1970 to 2010 pretty steadily goes up. So you would think that we have, you know, more money. Uh, So we're buying more, but actually what we're doing is we're borrowing more. That's the green line. So consumption and loans are pretty much together uh, and we're saving way less. That's the pink line. So there's really, you know, no correlation between earning more money and saving more money. Basically, the more that we earn and living in a world where it's so easy to buy things, the more we borrow and buy. So this is, you know, we're in a pretty tricky situation right now. And then, of course, the environmental consumption, the environmental impact of our consumption is just devastating for lack of a stronger word. Now, a lot of times living in the United States, we don't see the environmental impact of our consumption. But now that we have more of a global economy and just different ways to share news across the world, we do see a lot more of these images. And we'll talk a lot about this as well. So this is the inside of a whale's stomach. You know, basically marine life right now is being completely compromised because there's so much plastics in our ocean. So this is all the plastic that came out of one whale's stomach. Uh, And these stories are unfortunately far too common and easy to find many examples of this. So how do we begin to consume less? So it's clear that we have, there's a huge impact from our consumption that it touches all parts of our life, but how can we actually begin to consume less? What steps can we take? Easy steps can we take starting right now? So this is another trifecta. I believe that if we combine awareness with education and action, it really does lead to some lasting change. So in terms of awareness, one thing you can do that's just a simple way to really start tracking what's going on with what you're seeing and the actions that you're taking is to start building your awareness, right? So one way that you can do this 
is to take a break from consumption. So if you've done my boot camp before, if you've worked with me as a client, if you're in Clutter Boss Academy, you know that I am big on stopping the flow in. Take a complete break from purchasing things for a defined amount of time and that gives you the space to really think about and understand and examine your habits around consumption. So if you're on this video right now, let me know in the comments if you have stopped the flow in because you've worked with me before and if you've had any aha moments from that. Another way that you can start to build your awareness is to count the advertisements that you see in a day or even in a minute, right? This is a really, if you're home with your kids right now and you're doing the remote education, this is would be an interesting thing to do with your children. Count the advertisements that you see as a family in an hour. Examine your fears. What are your motivations for purchasing stuff? What is driving you specifically? What advertisements, what fear-based advertisements are pushing you towards towards you know going ahead and actually making a purchase so is there another way that you can start to address those fears determine where in your life consumption is impacting you the most so is it with your time is it with your money is it with your guilt over the environment let's say it's with your money maybe you can focus on a financial detox to help you kind of get your consumption under control what beliefs do you have about yourself that are shaping your consumption activity? So a lot of this is identity. You know, um, maybe you're trying right now to be this awesome um, mom who's cooking all these dinners from scratch and totally on top of things. Uh, so what part of your identity is pushing you towards purchasing? Um, and, you know, and maybe if you're in that role, you're buying a lot of things to help you cook from scratch, even though you really hate cooking from scratch. Uh, there's all different ways that identity can have play a role in our consumption. Another thing that you can do to really build your awareness is to find your lower consumption tribe. So if you are always spending time with people who like to do retail therapy, right, maybe you can surround yourself with people who are into more lower consumption things, right? You can find people to walk with or do yoga with or, you know, something else to fill that void that really helps you reduce your consumption. Another way that you can start to tackle this is to educate yourself. So I love to share just three quick examples here. Um, the first one is the Think Dirty app. So this app is a way that you can scan your cosmetics when you're in the store. Uh, you just scan the barcode and it shows you all of the different ingredients that are in your cosmetics and it rates the ingredients from super, you know, totally safe for humans to use to dangerous, right? So from zero to 10. Once you have a little bit more education around the stuff that you're purchasing, it helps you make a better purchasing decision. So if you find that there are some potentially dangerous chemicals or ingredients in the cosmetics that you're purchasing, you might rethink that purchase, right? So this is just one example of how you can start to educate yourself to just make better buying decisions, uh, to get, you know, to have more context to what you're doing. Learn so personally, and I know we all struggle with this, right? I have an unhealthy relationship with Amazon. Um, we as a family have really been trying to break the Amazon cord. One thing that I have done to help me really get more context around this is to learn about Amazon as a company. And I have learned some things that are very disturbing for me personally, the way that Amazon operates. So there's a lot of articles out there. Um, but if you're supporting a company, learn about their business practices, learn about where they source stuff from, learn about how they treat their customers and their personnel. And that might help you also just make different buying decisions. Um, when it came to the holidays, that was another area that we, I felt like we were really over consuming. So I started to learn more about where do our Christmas decorations come from? And there's very interesting information about this one town in China that produces 60% of our Christmas decorations. Um, and as you can imagine, 
it's not the North Pole, right? So that whole idea of the North Pole and things just shiny and beautiful uh, coming from this really happy place, uh, guess what? <laughs> it's not like that. Um, so just having this information really helped me and, uh, and our family to change our habits. So sometimes educating yourself can make a really significant difference. Add data to your awareness. So another thing that has helped me is to learn about the other components in the life cycle of stuff. So really thinking about where does this stuff come from anywhere? Like when I have like my cell phone right here, right? Where does this thing, how is this cell phone even produced? So learning about the life cycle of what is coming into our house can also be a way to educate yourself. And this um, graphic is from the story of stuff. I'm going to show a little video clip from them also. They are an excellent educational resource that I cannot recommend enough when it comes to really understanding the things in our life. So the life cycle of stuff is basically there's five components, extraction, production, distribution, consumption, which is what we're really focusing on, but I think it really gives a little bit more context to look at it from a, a broader sense, and then disposal. So just briefly, extraction is when the raw materials to create something are taken from the earth. So typically, you know, you use oil to make plastics, um, trees to make paper products, uh, but there's a lot of other things that are extracted from the earth to create the stuff that we have, including precious metals and, you know, all sorts of materials. So that's what extraction is in the life cycle. So everything, this phone, right, started off as the extraction of many different types of materials. After extraction, the raw materials go to a factory and they're produced into a thing, right? So both extraction and production are fraught with environmental concerns. And understanding this is another way that you can start to make different decisions. Um, obviously, we know that factories are very polluting. Um, in other countries, they don't have the same environmental controls that we have. So production is another area of the life cycle of something that creates an environmental footprint. And then distribution. This is where we take the now produced item and send it to wherever it is going to be sold. So distribution is another thing largely invisible to us, but it happens on a massive scale. Most of the time things come on container ships across the ocean to a port, uh, and then they're put onto a truck and trucked to your local big box store or UPS distribution center and brought, you know, and then you have the opportunity to go and purchase or it's brought right to you for consumption. <laughs> uh, so the consumption is when we actually consume the product. So what's interesting to me here, and just think about this for a section, for a, for a second, um, when we consume something, it feels, we call it brand new, right? Like I got a brand new thing, but actually by the time we consume a product, it's on the fourth step of its five step life cycle. So it's gone through extraction, production and distribution, and we get it when it's at in consumption. So really it's 80% of the way through its life cycle, even though it feels brand new to us. So just kind of grappling with that idea has also helped me adjust some of my consumption activities. Um, and then of course, disposal is when we toss it. So after we consume it, once it's in your house, once it's purchased, it is going to be disposed of, right? So the time to think about disposal of something is before you purchase it because you cannot avoid disposal after you consume something that it just will be disposed. Uh, every single thing that we consume, even if we find a way to increase its longevity, right? To bring it to someplace else where somebody else can use it, it is still going to be disposed of. So consumption is a big, consumption triggers disposal. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, anything that's produced will be disposed of, but in terms of what's in our homes, right? And disposal is, of course, has a tremendous environmental impact. So I wanna share with you guys, are you all still with me? <laughs> Give me a <laughs> thumbs up or you know something, let me know you are still here. I wanna share a very short video clip that talks about 
the story of plastic because I think that it is very impactful. So let me just switch over to my screen here. This is the power of technology. Um, Okay, so this is just a short video that talks about where things, where plastic ends up. And this is from the story of stuff. I will drop a link to this video. It's on YouTube in the comments also. Plastics are treated as a product that miraculously appears from nowhere and it goes to nowhere. It starts when the oil and the gas leave the wellhead. And it keeps on being a problem at every stage along the way. Why is it that we're seeing so much more plastics entering the environment? This is the story of plastics. We got into recycling because we thought it was the right thing to do. Of course, it is a disposal service, uh, you know, at its core, it's taking stuff that people don't want anymore and, and trying to do something better than landfill with it. In 2013, under significant pressure from our city council, um, we began accepting um, non-bottle mixed rigid plastic. So all the plastic containers, berry containers, keg cups, plastic cold cups, you know, from Starbucks. Procter and Gamble wants us all to believe that all their packaged goods are in, you know, totally environmentally sound packaging. You know, they want us all using single-use packaged products so that we're just, you know, on the supply chain. It's totally unfair to the cities and the recyclers on the back end because then everyone says, oh, it's recyclable. It's recycle-ready. You should collect it. Well, then what? The United States was shipping over 50% of its plastics and its papers to China. The situation was very similar in Europe. We were just shipping it all to China. China will deal with it. And we built up these big recycling programs and everything was about recycle. Recycle, recycle, recycle is, is the solution to everything because we had China there. So China's just said, you know what? We're sick of being a dumping ground and we don't want this stuff introduced into our country. I see the China thing as a, as a reckoning because it's all been this false market where we've just been shipping stuff to China. This is, in my 25 year career, this is the biggest recycling crisis globally that we have ever seen. At the same time, the tons are going up and up and up. The price is going down and down and down and down to the point where now it's costing us 50 bucks a ton to get rid of. If you think we're just gonna take it from China and ship it to Thailand or Indonesia or Vietnam, where is it going to go? When the government shut down the recycling center, most people shift to like more remote or hidden villages or other countries. From US. This uh, Nestle? From UK. Yeah, it's from Australia. It's come from Toronto. Toronto. Dunking Donut. It's from Oregon. From yeah, New Zealand. Tivana. Ya, awalnya kita memang uh, merasa plastik ini sesuatu yang uh, bagus ya. Jadi ini praktis begitu kemudian orang tapi kemudian terakhir kita bisa melihat bagaimana plastik itu berubah menjadi sebuah uh, bencana bagi kita karena Okay, so that is really difficult to watch, I know. Um, so let me go back to my slideshow. We can go into more into depth about 
plastics and recycling. Uh, definitely, I have a little bit more in the slideshow, but um, we can talk about it in the Q&A also. So, okay. <laughs> Um, I know that that's really hard to watch and that's, it's interesting because when I started to do research about this, the initial reactions that I got were really, really negative. People just did not want to believe what was actually happening. So we're going to go back and talk about plastics in a second, but let's just focus right now on what actions you can take to impact change. So I think at this point, it's really clear that consumption, if we can reduce our consumption, that is the best choice that we can make because it's disposal. Of, well, every point in the life cycle of any of, of anything that we own is complicated, right? So from the extraction to the production, to the distribution, to the consumption, to the dis disposal, it all creates different questions and not as many answers. So the best thing we can possibly do, and I'm gonna say it over and over again, is consume less. Just overall reduce our consumption. That is the number one action that we can do that I believe can make an impact right now. So I also personally think that every small action is important and it is impactful. Um, you know, sometimes we feel like this program, this, this problem is so overwhelming that we can't do anything as a consumer, as an individual person, we can't tackle it, but actually we can, we absolutely can by reducing the amount that we consume amongst other things. Uh, so how do we do that? Make small but consistent changes. So if you want to start reducing your consumption, start easy, start reducing, uh, you know, Start in just one small area of your life. Stop buying plastic water bottles, right? That's one small, incredibly impactful action that you can that you can take right now. So that would be an example of a small but consistent change. Do not try and layer another action on until you are consistent with your first action, right? So when you're consistent with the first action, it just becomes who you are. It is your habit. So when you're in the habit of only using reusable water bottles, then add another layer, Chain, make another small change. Build in stop and think opportunities. So before you make a purchase, create a way for you to stop and think about what you are going to purchase. So maybe that is add it to your cart on Amazon, but don't purchase it for two days. Um, Put a note on your credit card. Is this worth it, right? So you have that little reminder before you use your credit card to stop and think about your purchase because the time to really make these decisions is before you make the purchase. Not don't, you know, having the regret afterwards is not helpful. <laughs> it doesn't help your emotional well-being. Uh, it doesn't change anything. So stop and think before you purchase. Ask better questions. One of the questions when I started researching recycling was really, you know, I, I'm calling all of these recycling companies, uh, local towns and municipalities, and I'm asking, where is our recycling going? And I'm being told it's sold at market. But I knew that the market for recycling had crashed. There was no more China. So where is that market? That was the question that I was asking, and nobody could really tell me an answer. Also consider packaging when purchasing. So packaging drives a lot of my decision-making processes right now when it comes to stuff, right? Why is our stuff so wrapped up in so much excessive packaging? So if there's a ton of packaging on something, that will really be a big part of my decision-making process. Do I want to bring all of this packaging into my life? Because then it's my problem, right? So consider packaging when purchasing. Remember the fourth R, reduce, reuse, recycle, refuse. The fourth R is the best R, refuse. Say no thank you. I know the straw thing, right? Say no thank you to straws. Say no thank you to plastic cutlery. Say no thank you to excessive packaging. Say no thank you. Nope, no thanks. I'll pass. That is the best R. It's really four R's, reduce, reuse, recycle, Refuse, start with refuse. <laughs> Here are some more actionable ideas. Cancel your cable and you will see less 
advertisements. Start going to your library as soon as they open up again <laughs> um, because you can borrow books instead of purchasing books. Use your community. This is a concept that I love. If you need something, post it on Facebook. Say, hey, I'm looking for a slow cooker. Does anyone have one? I need to borrow an air mattress because I have guests coming into town. I need, my daughter is a size eight and she needs a whole new wardrobe. Does anybody have clothing that their kids have outgrown? Use your community first and foremost. Delete shopping apps on your phone. Start using only cash. This is a great way to also deal with your financial clutter. Buy used. So, so always consider purchasing used before purchasing new. Follow different social media accounts. So instead of following Macy's and Nordstrom and The Gap on your social media, Maybe follow The Minimalists or <laughs> Jess Marcy. <laughs> um, follow different social media accounts that really encourage this way of thinking and don't prompt you to consume. Only buy things, now this is an interesting one, only buy things that have a visible life cycle. So this is something I've really started to try and figure out. When I purchase something, is this something that I could theoretically produce myself? Generally, if I could, like in theory, produce it myself, then I feel like the environmental impact of this item is less. So for example, I needed a basket recently and I have a friend who's a basket weaver. I talked to her about where her materials come from and it's all stuff that I could actually grow if I wanted to. Uh, so I thought, okay, I can totally see the, the full um, life cycle of this basket and I can compost it because I know exactly what materials it's made of when it's done. So this feels a lot better as a purchase. Anything plastic, I can't really visualize the life cycle of that. I, I have no way to extract oil right, or turn it into plastic. So that's so foreign to me that that's a, a thought that says, okay, I, I couldn't produce this. Uh, so probably the environmental impact is higher. It's just a different way of thinking of it. Get organized. When you're organized, you can find what you have and you're less likely to purchase more. Grow a garden. This is a great time to be growing gardens. Uh, barter for things, right? So instead of adding something to your house, you know, get rid of something as you add something. So bartering is great. Consider a work uniform or just a minimalist uh, wardrobe. We, we talk about wardrobe all the time. Uh, make your own wrapping paper. If there's one thing that I wish people never purchased again, it would be wrapping paper. You can use so many things around your house as wrapping paper. Um, try making your own wrapping paper. Choose experiences over stuff. This is really trending right now, which I love. Uh, instead of gifting a thing, gift time with somebody, gift an experience. It's the experiences that really stick with us for the long term anyway. Rethink your holiday tradition. So this goes back to gifting experiences. Have zero months. So have a month where you just don't consume anything. Have a month where you don't spend any money. Have a month where you don't buy anything that comes in plastic. Have zero months because that can really help you both examine your habits and then it resets your zero. So I like to think of this um, like, have you ever stopped eating sugar for a week or for a month? When you go back to eating sugar, you can't tolerate as much sugar as you could in the beginning. So have zero months with stuff also. It's a great way to reset your zero. Practice, oh, oh consider uh, natural home decor, right? So instead of going to home goods to purchase plastic home decor, go outside and gather some beautiful natural home decor. Make it an art project. Uh, you know, so have, that's a great way to also have just some mindfulness and do something fun. Uh, practice mindfulness and gratitude. Be grateful for what we already have and actually practice it. Make your list of five things every day that you're grateful for. Take one minute and sit in silence saying, giving thanks, right? So these are great ways to just be grateful and feel grateful for what we already have. Uh, give back with your time. Instead of purchasing something, volunteer, right? Choose quality over instant gratification. If you're going to invest in something for your life, invest in something that is going to last. Even if you have to save up for longer for it or wait a little bit longer to get it. Uh, over the long term, it will, be, it will help you consume less and it'll be more meaningful for you and it'll last longer. 
Use up what you have before buying more. Consider sustainable alternatives. Say no to single use. Say no to single use. Combine your errands and ride your bike. So actually, I've gotten really good at this because I'm only going to the grocery store once every two weeks now. So I have been practicing this skill of combining everything I need to do and purchasing more fresh produce and making it last for longer. Uh, this has been a good experience for me uh, in this sense. Use reusable coffee cups, cutlery, and dishes. Drink tap water. Shop local. And then uh, the final step is to create a home that you don't want to leave. So this goes back to organizing and decluttering and having that space that really nourishes your soul, you're less likely to want to go shopping then. Okay, here are my random thoughts. Everything that you own will end up in a landfill one day. This is a cold, hard truth. Everything you own will end up in a landfill one day. There is no way around this. Every time I bring this up in group discussions or clutter coaching calls, people talk about how they had to clean out somebody's house. Usually it's a parent's house, right? And oftentimes after you remove the things that you want and you have the garage sale, you hire the dumpster and everything goes into the landfill. So this is a cold, hard truth. Again, hard to hear, but once you kind of grapple with it, it can make a significant difference in how you choose to consume. Everything that you own, everything, is going to end up in a landfill one day. I love this. Look around. All of that clutter used to be money, and all of that money used to be time. So at the end of the day, the more that you're consuming, the more time and money it is stealing from you. So look around, all of that clutter used to be money and all of that money used to be time. Be the inspiration. So be the person that talks about this to other people. When I, uh, in the beginning of 2019, I decided that we were done with single use plastic in this household. Um, and we were gonna just try and not purchase plastic to see how that went. So I had, I ended up, I, you know, I was, I, I had to get my kids on board, um, but I ended up with a lot of single use plastic, like ketchup containers and stuff like that at the end where I used them up and I knew that there was no recycling happening. So I was thought, what could I do with these containers? And I started growing vegetables hydroponically in the containers on a whim. This whole thing totally took off and inspired a lot of other people to really think about their plastic consumption, how they could grow their own vegetables inside. I mean, it was just totally a, a random thing, but it inspired others. And because other people were inspired, it really forced me to stick with it, right? Because if you're the inspiration, it's helpful <laughs> to help you not go back to your old habits. Now, over time, we have brought more plastic back into our life, but it's been done in a very mindful way. So there's different layers to this and it's never perfect, right? But if you can start talking about it and inspiring others, that's where this domino effect comes in. Okay, that is my last slide. I just wanna kind of talk a little bit more about the recycling because I know that there's gonna be questions about that. So let me just, here we go. Hi guys. <laughs> uh, so here's the deal with recycling. So I showed that little video clip um, in 2000, okay. Right off the bat, let me just say, of all of the plastics ever produced in the world, so of all of the plastics that we have ever produced, can you guys guess how much has actually been recycled? So just guess in the comments, put a number in the comments. The point of this question is just to share that we think we really, really, really tie recycling to this environmentally sound identity that we have. But, and I don't think most people, politicians, uh, lawmakers, I don't think most people realize this. So Cindy says 25%. Are there any other guesses? How much plastic has ever been recycled in the history of plastic production? 5%, 9%, 6%, okay. So the answer, so Kelly got the answer right. The answer is 9%. So 9% of all plastic ever produced has actually been recycled. 
And here's the little caveat to that. Of that 9% that's been recycled, the vast majority has actually been downcycled. So you, it's not like you have a water bottle and you recycle it and it turns into another water bottle. It actually is downcycled into a product that typically is not then recycled. So it's downcycled into polyester fiber or into the bottom of a car, you know, like a pl the plastic form that goes underneath cars or into Trex decking or into something that is not actually going to be recycled. So even though we are tossing, okay, so here's another question. Yes, it's a very low percentage. If you got a 9% on an exam, you would have failed by a lot, <laughs> right? So here is another question that I have for you. Of all of the plastic that you, and there's no judgment in this answer, it's just a curiosity. Of all of the plastic that you've brought into your house, what percentage have you processed and put into your recycling bin? I bet <laughs> that that number is a lot higher than 9%. So where does this difference come from? We are consuming a lot of plastic, recycling it, but only 9% has ever been recycled, right? So right off the bat, <laughs> something is not adding up. Um, so in 2018, so basically the way that recycling was set up was that, you know, recycling in theory is great, but in practice, it's not really so great. So when, what happened in, in a nutshell is we were importing, we are, we import a ton of products from China. So it comes over on these container ships, right? And once we empty the container, they're shipped back to China. So somebody figured out filling those empty containers up with our plastic recycling and shipping it back to China where there was a market for our discarded materials. However, <laughs> um, what was happening, we switched to a single stream system in the United States for recycling, all of our recycling. And now people think they can just throw everything into that recycling bin, right? So if you're not sure, put it in the recycling bin because there's a chance that it might get recycled. So who has ever thought that? A chance that it might get recycled. So what happens when you put all of those chances into the recycling bin is that they have to be sorted out at the recycling center, which by the way, creates, that's another form of energy, right? So they, they run these massive machines to sort out the materials, but all of those materials that can't actually be recycled and it can only be recycled if there's a market for it. So anything that there's no market for, regardless of whether it can theoretically be recycled, can contaminate the stuff that can be recycled. Plastic is only valuable as a resource. Recycled plastic is only valuable as a resource if it's mostly pure. So if it's all number one, all number two, all number three. But when we add in all this other stuff into our recycling, we contaminate our big like bushels of recycling, our big pallets of our big you know, walls of recycling, our big blocks of recycling are not then able to be 100% pure material. So China, basically what they did in the end of 2000, they announced this in the beginning of 2018 and it went into effect in the end of 2018. They said, we have tremendous environmental damage from basically being the garbage dump for the entire world. And so we are going to stop taking everyone else's recycling, especially plastic recycling, if it's not 99.5% pure material. So the technology in the United States and in most of the world, um, and of course there's some pockets where it's a little better, but in general, we can only get to about 95 or 96% pure material. So we ha no longer have a market to sell all of this recycling. So you need a market for recycled materials for recycling to be effective, to work at all. So what do we do? There's two options. Landfill it. Oh, hold on a second. Got to close this thing. Landfill our plastics, right? Or sell it to a different market. Where is the other market? 
So we were for a long, for a, well, for a couple of months anyway, shipping, well, some people were shipping plastics to other developing nations. And what are they doing? They don't have the infrastructure to deal with this amount of plastic. Um, obviously, the same environmental concerns that China had didn't go away when we brought our plastics to another market. Um, so a lot of times what happens is the plastic is burned, just open air burned, or dumped into a river that then goes into the ocean. This is how so much plastic gets into the ocean. Uh, so there's simply too much plastic for and, and not enough industry to support it. So as far as I can tell right now, uh, that was in the end of 2018. Um, I started calling our local municipalities, garbage pickup services. Nobody could really give me any answers <laughs> until finally somebody did. Um, and that person will re remain anonymous. Um, but I was told from a very reliable source that plastic is being, all of our plastic is being landfilled. Now this is in the beginning of 2019. Things have shifted slightly now, but slightly. So it's all being trucked to a landfill. It's being sorted out in the recycling center and being trucked to a landfill because there's no place to sell it. So you might wonder how come your recycling bill, maybe your recycling bill hasn't changed, right? Why would this be the case? A lot of towns are locked into like five year long contracts with garbage providers. So this happened very suddenly. This was like an overnight change in 2018. So if your town or your garbage pickup person is locked into a long term contract, your prices for that you're paying for your garbage pickup are not going to change until that contract is up. But the cost of recycling right now is is higher than it's ever been. Uh, and the, so the impact will eventually trickle down to consumers. But you still might not make that connection unless you kind of know the backstory here. So that's in terms of, OK, that's plastic. In terms of glass, glass is very heavy, so it requires a very local infrastructure to deal with the recycled glass. It cannot be shipped far. And that is what prevents a lot of glass from being recycled because there's just no local market for it. Even though recycled glass is a very valuable commodity, it can't be shipped very far. So a lot of glass is also landfilled. Uh, and then when there's metal is always, that's always recycled, right? So there's a tremendously high value for recycled scrap metal. So aluminum, steel, that's thumbs up for recycling. Uh, and then paper, I really have never gotten a solid answer on what happens with paper, but I do know that one of the complications with paper is oftentimes we think it's paper, but it's like a paper with a plastic, it's like a composite material. So you think about like a milk carton, it's not all paper, it's like paper and plastic. Okay, so <laughs> I really appreciate that you guys have hung in here and listened to this for so long. Are there any questions? Patty, I know that New York City mandates this, and this is the thing that just blows my mind. Because clearly right now, when we process our recycling, we wash it at home. So we use hot water. The water is heated, probably by a coal-fired power plant. Then we put it into a different container, and then it is shipped to a recycling center where there is a tremendous more usage of electricity and power to sort everything out only to landfill it, right? So it's it's just mind boggling. But I honestly don't believe that most people really have a, a good sense of recycling because we've been told something completely, completely differently. Um, okay. <laughs> oh, thanks, Tammy. Uh, what about burning, Carol? So that's a good question. Uh, well, okay, let me just say, he, I'll back up for a second. There's a couple of good ways that to get rid of, uh, there's no good way to get rid of stuff, but there's a couple of better ways. So actually landfilling is not a bad option. We uh, in the United States, we have very good landfill technology. We protect the ground. We release the emissions correctly. Uh, so we actually have really good landfill technology and we have a lot of space for landfill. So landfilling is not terrible. I mean, it's not ideal, but it's not terrible. Um, centers that burn plastics, uh, they also have environmental controls in the United States, so they capture some of the emissions. Um, I don't think that I'm really qualified to address that. 
I know that oftentimes they're being fined for <laughs> failing to meet their emission standards, um, but I don't have enough information to answer that. But I do know that in other countries, it is literally just burned, open air burned in the middle of the night. Um, if you start Googling this and looking on YouTube, um, PBS just did an investigative story that I shared a couple of weeks ago about plastics that basically says everything that I'm saying, except they actually went to the other countries and did some investigative reporting, which I don't have the budget to do. <laughs> um, so this is the information that I'm sharing. When I started sharing this about a year and a half ago, it was considered controversial what I was saying, but now there is so much information out there uh, and so much reporting that has been done on this that it's there's no longer any controversy over the information. This you know, but start poking around. You'll it'll be really um, you'll find a lot of interesting answers. Um, okay, so Susan, can we go back to the consumer doing all separating at home like it was 10 years ago? So so can we go back to when it wasn't single stream? I think probably that's ultimately what will have to happen. Uh, for recycling to be viable, we need to have much better control over the separation of the materials in the you know at home. Um, but I think we also need to hold out these producers responsible. I mean, these big companies that say recyclable, it's not actually recyclable. And in this PBS, um, or there's actually no market for it to be recyclable. It's only recyclable in theory. In this PBS thing, that uh, story that they did, they talked about how they tried to remove the word recyclable from, from the containers and they weren't able to. I mean, that was lobbied against and all of this stuff. So just, you know, every time I see a sign that says, recyclable, I I just want to take a picture of it and say this is totally inaccurate. Theoretically recyclable, actually not recycled. Uh, and also, you know what, Susan, There's uh, there are places in other countries, there are towns and munis municipalities in other parts of the world that do a really good job of really separating and sorting their recycling. So I do think that that is part of the bigger answer. Yeah, Patty says the old landfill on Staten Island is capped and they are capturing the methane release and supplementing for gas. Right, so landfill management is actually really good right now. Jenny says, I'm confused because I thought I was doing my part cleaning jars and cans and recycling. Is it all for nothing or it's basically, it's just basically the plastic? Jenny, so here's what I would, would love for you to do. Contact your recycling center contact your do you have a is it town or is it a private pickup figure out see if you can find some answers to what is happening with your recycling right now with your glass and your plastic um and if they say it's being sold at market ask where that market is the best thing that i have found in terms of finding this information is i actually posted on facebook eventually and said does anybody know somebody or does anybody work in our recycling center does anybody know somebody who works in the recycling center i'm trying to get because we have one major recycling processing center in our area i'm trying to figure out where this is going and that like basically connected me with quite a few people who were able to give me accurate information no, and I will say our garbage pickup, so our old garbage company went out of business because of the cost of recycling. And finally, our new garbage pickup, they told me they're not recycling anything. So, <laughs> I mean, I thought that was very honest. A lot of the other places that I called said, oh yes, it just goes to the, you know, the recycling sorting center, uh, which is great. But then what happens after that? Where does it go after that? And if you're telling me that it's being sold at market, who is it being sold to? What is the market, right? So it might, I mean, it's possible that it's all for nothing, but it's probably, what's more likely is that it's way more nuanced than that. And there's probably some useful thing. There's some useful bit that you can do when it comes to recycling, but then knowing that most of it's not being recycled can help you change your consumption habits. Hey, Willette, <laughs> glad you're here. Carol says, I'm very diligent about recycling, but a lot of people 
which aren't, which makes me wonder if I should bother recycling or just throw it out. Carol, well, the answer is less, <laughs> right? So consuming less in general is the best option because the recycling is so complicated and most of the time stuff is not getting recycled, right? So <laughs> yeah, so if you guys are on this presentation, please make phone calls and report back to us because it's really, really helpful for me and for everyone else to hear that you found out in your local area this was, you know, this was the situation or to hear that you couldn't get an answer or to hear that there is a local industry in your area for recycling glass. Um, you know, it, it's that's very helpful. So definitely make some phone calls and report back. But remember, <laughs> the best thing that we can do ultimately is just consume less, period. That's it. So that's my Earth Day newsflash. <laughs> Are there any other questions out there? Okay, so um, I do wanna say, if you are tuning in and you don't normally watch my stuff or um, you know, if you're anywhere, well, what, anywhere, what, you know, anywhere, um, I am gonna start offering these programs that I do remotely. Uh, so I actually am in communication with a library right now that I had set up a scheduled a, a workshop with, um, and we are going to switch to a remote setup like this. So if your organization that you are connected with would like to bring in a program that I do, uh, I would be happy to do this, this same sort of setup, uh, maybe in Zoom, so there's a little more interaction. Um, and share it with other people. So just connect with me about that. Um, <laughs> you are so welcome, Tani. Thank you so much for being here. All right, you guys, now go outside, enjoy the beautiful earth, right? Give thanks that we have such incredible nature around us um, and that we can look out windows and see nice clear skies and we're not looking at pollution all the time because uh, that truly is something that we should feel blessed for because that is not the case for everyone around the, around the world. Uh, I will post the links to everything I talked about after this, and I am so happy you guys were here. Have a great Earth Day. Bye now.